Church family, it's so good to see you. I'm so glad that you have tuned in to uh, watch this video. And I, I hope that you're encouraged. I hope that you find uh, strength in this. Uh, we want to get into the Word so the Word will get into us. And so that's why we've done this whole reading program, is that we want to get into the Word as a church family. Uh, we want to grow in Christ. And so one of the best ways, I think, to do that is to, by reading the Scriptures, by opening up the text and getting into it and asking difficult questions and uh, studying it and diving deep into it. So uh, I hope that you've done that. I hope you've uh, profited from this. I hope you've been encouraged encouraged by this. We are in week 17 of our reading plan as a church body, and so that's very exciting that we've made it 17 weeks, and so maybe some of you are behind. Uh, let me just tell you, that's okay. Uh, and read at your pace, read at your level. Even if it takes you two, reads, two years to read through the scriptures, that's great. Uh, read through it. There are several Christians that have sit in church pews and have done things and, and they have never read through the entire Bible. And so that makes me sad. That makes me sad as a pastor. It makes me sad as a Christian. And so our, our week 17, we were kind of, we opened up starting uh, in 2 Samuel. And so David is now king. And we see, we're going to pick up in verse 11, or chapter 11. And we're going to read 1 through 5. And so that's kind of what stuck out to me this week is just sin. And how do we deal with sin? How, what is the proper way to deal with sin? Because all of us sin, all of us have struggles, all of us are, uh, even though we have been forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Christ, we, we still sin. And so what happens? How do we, uh, how do we go about f not fixing that? Because Jesus has fixed that for us. But what is the proper way to respond to sin? Right? What is the proper way to respond to sin? And so chapter 11 says this. In the spring, when the kings marched out to war, David sent Joab and his officers and all of Israel to destroy the Ammonites and besiege Rabbah. And David remained in Jerusalem. When even David got up from his bed and strolled around from rooftop for, uh, on the roof of the palace, from the roof he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. So David sent someone to inquire uh, about her, and he said, Isn't that Bathsheba, daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent a messenger to her, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she had just been purified herself from the uncleanliness afterwards. She returned home. The woman conceived and sent word to inform David, I am pregnant. All right, so sin uh, does not exist in a vacuum. It takes place in a certain time and a certain ways, right? But, but see, Satan isn't as creative as God. So by looking or by taking David's temptation and sin in verses 11, 1 through 5, what we just read, we see a paradigm, I think, for all temptation and all sin. There's three things that stick out to me, right? Uh, first thing that sticks out to me is David was blessed, uh, life was actually pretty good for David at this point. The kingdom is established. Everybody loves him. Uh, if you go back and read chapter t uh, 10 of 2 Samuel, you'll see David just emerged from a victory from a slew of battles. So it may seem surprising to us that David uh, succumbs or falls into temptation at this moment of extreme blessing. Right? In, in times of adversity, sure, sin is appealing. It acts at like a savior, an escape, something to give us a quick fix we think we need. But what's so dangerous about blessings? The danger in blessing is that we tend to forget just how dependent we are on God. Right? When, when life showers us with goodness, what happens? What do you normally assume? Uh, and I would say this is what happens in my life. When, when, I, when things are going well, things are going great, I assume that I have caused it. That because I, I am doing this or I am doing that, that these good things are happening to me. But see, the, when we flip the coin and we look at the other side, when bad things happen to us or bad things are happening to us or we're in a, in a rut, we want to blame somebody and most of the times we blame God. Right. And so blessings are dangerous because, hey, uh, when uh, and I just want to remember that, that we always want to be focused on Jesus. We always want to be focused on Christ, that Christ is giving us the blessings, that God is blessing us. And so that way we're always remember that like, hey, God is so good to me. And, and it's always that dependentness on God. Actually, Proverbs 38 and 9 says this. And this is great. Love Proverbs. Uh, it says, keep 
falsehood and deceit for words far from me. Listen to this. Give me neither poverty nor wealth. Feed me with food I need. Otherwise, I might have too much. Right? I've never heard anybody say, hey, I want to make sure that I'm not poor or I'm not wealthy. Right? I just want to be right there in the middle. I just want you to feed me what I need. Otherwise, I might have too much. Right? That is anti-culture in America today. And so, uh, but the Proverbs tells us this. Why? Why? Uh, and denying you saying, right, who is the Lord? Right? We forget who has given us those blessings. We forget who has showered us with those things. Right? Who is the Lord? Right? Let's not forget who has blessed us, who has, who has loved us. Or I might have nothing and steal. And what happens this, right? If you're poor or if you're wealthy, you might say, who's the Lord? Right? I've done all this. I've built this empire. Or if you have nothing, you're stealing, you are profaning. You are taking the God's name in vain. Right? And so be careful. When we are blessed or when things are going well in our life, we just need to be careful because sin, that's when I think sin really comes ahead because our eyes are not focused on Christ. Our eyes are focused on self and we're patting, we're patting ourselves on the back and thinking how great we are. Right? Uh, second thing I think sin, when sin creeps in is one, when we have a tremendous amount of blessings. Two is when we are disengaged. And what do I mean by this? Is that it's not a random detail that David has sent Joab and the whole army out to battle. Right? But where, where was David? At the time of the year when kings go out to battle, David was back at home. David the warrior has become David the vacationer. Right? And his lack of engagement made him uh, open or susceptible to uh, cheap thrills. The way to success- successfully resist the enticement of this world isn't merely to have a strong will to say no. It is to be busy with a higher purpose. Right? For many people, their lives are so empty, so pointless, so devoid of something more that the excitement of sex or the excitement of sin promises a fulfillment they desperately crave. We simply weren't designed to live our lives on the sideline. Right? God created everyone or created us to engage in battle, to pursue uh, his ministry with zeal and courage. Only a a vision of what God wants to do in you will give you a sense of purpose strong enough to free you from boredom that leads to sin. See, only a a vision of what God has done for you in the gospel will keep you from giving your soul away to idols. If we had that perspective, sure, we would still sin, but we would find so much less space for it. Right? Bathsheba sure is tempting when we are sitting around staring off into space. See, David would not have found a, a bit more difficult to sleep with her if he would have been 50 miles away, if he would have been with his army, if he would have been with Joab, where he should have been. Right? But he was not. Here's the third thing I think that all of us, right, we, we, when we extreme blessings, uh, when we're disengaged with the higher purpose, when we're disengaged with God, when we're disengaged with the scriptures, right, we are more prone to sin, right? The third thing is David was in a place where he could be tempted. Uh, David is wandering around the roof alone, peering over uh, at one rooftop to another to another, right? I mean, this is the ancient equivalent of staying up late and browsing the internet. Uh, it is not a surprise what happened next. One thing I have learned through or from painful experience through the years of ministry is this. It is easier to avoid temptation than it is to resist sin. Right? Don't get me wrong, resisting sin is important, and it, immensely so. We must cultivate a hab- habit of coming face-to-face with temptation and still resisting sin. But the world throws enough temptation our way, do we really need to go and seek out more of it? Right? It, it doesn't matter the venue, it doesn't matter the sin, sin hurts people. 
What I mean by that, it affects someone's mother, someone's father, someone's daughter, someone's son. Even if sin only affects you, just you, right, it still hurts. And so there's been this misconception in Christianity that God's rules are given to us for our, 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 to ruin our fun or, or to stop us from experiencing life. But God's rules are given to us for our good, right? To show us that the most life-giving way of interacting with others. See, God doesn't want us want to keep us from sinning because he wants to ruin our fun. He wants to keep us from sinning because he knows how deeply sin hurts us. All right, one more point with 11, 1 through 5 is we see in verse 4. And I, 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 I was thinking about this and I was like, man, this is what we do. We still do this. Bathsheba, right? So verse 4, David sent a messenger to her and when she came, he slept with her, right? Okay, now, now she had just been purifying herself from her uncleanliness after she returned home, right? And, and so you think she's like doing this act, she's purifying herself, like forgiveness, like it's those people who go out all night on Saturday night and then show up Sunday morning for church and you know, they had just been committing all kinds of sin and life and we think, okay, well I'm good because I've came to church, all right? And I, I can't tell you how many people I've come across, how many people I have ministered with, like, no, no, I'm good because I went to church. No, no, I'm good because I went to church camp. No, no, I'm good because I went to Bible study. You know, and so it's like this thing that if we do this, then I'm forgiven because of that, right? And that's just an awful way of thinking, right? That's a very man-centered theology in the sense that if I do this, then I'm forgiven. No, God's, God's forgiven you. God's forgiven you of your sin. We look to the cross, look to Christ. And so what happens in sin? When we sin, I think there's a couple things we see. Either we confess that sin or we try to hide it. And a lot of us will try to hide our sin. And so David, he went and tried to hide his sin. 11, uh, 6 through 27, we see where David is trying to hide his sin. Uh, so not only, one, David has committed adultery. Two, David calls for uh, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, and says, hey, bring him home. Uh, and because, one, David knows that she's pregnant, and so he's like, hey, if I can get her home and they can, you know, be together, then, you know, I may be in the clear here. But here's the crazy thing. Uriah has honor. The one, the one who should have honor, the king, uh, Uriah has more honor, right? His buddies are out on the f- ground sleeping in the tent. They're in battle. He's like, I don't understand why I'm at home. And so he's, uh, he's going to sleep outside his door, right? So that's plan A. Plan A backfires on David. He goes to plan B. He gets uh, Uriah uh, drunk. He feeds him and he thinks, okay, now he's going to go in and he's going to go sleep with his wife. And that, 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 that plan fails as well. And then plan, plan three or plan C is he's going to send him to the front lines. And so, uh, which is wild to me. I mean, David writes out, hey, put Uriah on the front lines so he'll be killed and gives the letter to Uriah. And Uriah then takes that letter to Joab and puts him on the front lines, right? And so it's, it's crazy to think about that, hey, this is what he is coming to do. And so uh, we see in second, we see if we fast forward to chapter 12, so we're kind of doing 11 to 12, and I love this, one of my favorite stories, and uh, I don't know why, but it just is, in chapter 12, it says this, and and this is the Lord sending the prophet Nathan to confront David in his sin, and uh, so the Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he arrived, he said to him, there were two men in a certain city, one rich the other poor. The rich man had a very large flock and herds, right? And so uh, before we keep going, I know this was popping in my head, is that you have to understand Nathan is coming and confronting the king of his sin, right? And so he couldn't just come in there and be like, hey, king, you sinned, right? He's coming in there and it was confronting him in such a way. I mean, I could just imagine Nathan was a little terrified to come in there and tell the king, hey, you're in sin, right? You've dishonored God. You have displeased God. And so, but he's come in there and he starts telling this story. Uh, and, it, it's, it's, and to David, he probably thinks the story is real. He probably thinks the story is true. He probably thinks that this is really happening in his kingdom. 
And so keep that in mind. But the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb and he had, that he had bought. He raised her and he grew up with him and with his children. From his meager food she would eat. From his cup she would drink. In his arms she would sleep. She was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle or prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guests. And this is, this is incredible. David, infuriated with the man, said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die because he has done this thing and shown no pity. He must pay four lambs for the lamb. Nathan replied, David, you are that man. You are the man. Right, this is what the Lord of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. I rescued you from Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that were not enough, I would have given you even more. Right, this is amazing. The Lord is saying, I would have given you more if you would have just asked, if you would just come to me, right? It's uh, as if you were to take money out of your dad's wallet. It's like, son, if you were just to ask, I would have given you more. If you were just to come to me, you didn't have to steal from me, you didn't have to take, you could have just came and I would have gave it. Right, and so David is this man. And I want you to think, maybe you haven't committed adultery or murder, right? I hope... I hope most of you haven't. But we all have sinned. And I believe this. Everyone is capable of David's crimes. Right? I know, I know this because that's the nature of unconfessed sin. It changes us. When, when confronted with the results of our sin, as David and Bathsheba, when Bathsheba got pregnant, we can hide it. We can rationalize it. Or, or best yet, I think what we're best at is we can shift blame, right? Think about the garden. Think about Adam and Eve and what do they do, right? As soon as God confronts Adam, Adam goes, whoa, 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 God, it was not me. It was the woman you gave me, right? And, and since he's, only, he's shifting blame not only to Eve but to God, he goes, God, it's your fault that I'm in this predicament because you gave me the woman, right? So we're, we are the master of shifting blame. And so, what I want to leave you with, what I want you to be thinking about is this. Right? It's not, the question is not, do you sin? Right? Everybody would be, yeah, I sin. Right? Everyone sins. The question better, though, is what are you going to do after you sin? What, what do you do after you sin? How do you respond? Do you hide it? Do you rationalize it? Do you shift blame because of your sin? Or do you confess it? Do you, do you run to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need your help. I need you. And so how, and the answer to that question is life or death, right? And I think a lot of times when we sin, we try to do more or we try to do better or we try to be, uh, do good. And we think, well, if I do enough good to outweigh my sin, then I'm good. But see, the problem with that is the scriptures, right? We can't do enough good to reach God. Only God can forgive us. Only God can give us the peace. Right? And so, answer yourself. What, what do you do? Does sin bother you when we sin? So these are questions we must wrestle with. These are questions we must go through. I mean, you just keep reading 2 Samuel, you'll see what, I mean, read Psalm 51, and you'll see David just wrestling with this and realizing that he had one sinned against God. So when we sin, yeah, we hurt others, we hurt ourselves, but more importantly, we sin against God. And so think about that. Meditate on that. Wrestle with that. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much just for uh, 
technology. Again, we love it. Uh, I love that we can continue our Sunday night Bible study. Father, I just pray as we continue to read through the Word, uh, Father, together as a church body, that we would encourage one another, that we would challenge one another, that, Father, as we see sin in our lives, that we would want to cut it out. We see sin in other people's lives. We would not just want to uh, call them out on it just to call them out on it, but we would call them out on it so they, they would uh, pursue you. Right? Give us boldness. Give us confidence. Father, we love you and we thank you for your son that we may have forgiveness and we may stand in your presence. Father, man, we may be with you. That's amazing. That's incredible. And so, Father, let us stop running. Let us stop trying to hide just like our parents did, Adam and Eve. They hid from you. How foolish, Lord. Let us come to you. Let us run to you. You can handle us. We thank you for being a God that wants to have a relationship with us, wants to know us. We praise you and we thank you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. We'll keep getting in the word, keep diving into it, keep wrestling with it, keep looking at it. And so next week we'll have another video uh, where we're unpacking uh, the Bible. And so it's been a lot of fun just reading the scriptures with you. And so I hope you continue to join us. Thanks so much. Have a good night.